Amen. Amen. Well, we come uh, this morning to Philippians chapter 4, and you can turn there in your Bibles, Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 23, the, the closing uh, verses of Paul's letter uh, to the church in Philippi, uh, these believers who he loved, a, a beloved book of, of many, and, and one filled with wonderful truth. But we're going to look this morning at, at the closing uh, passage, Philippians 4, 10 uh, through 23. We'll read uh, towards the end and consider Paul's theme here of, of contentment, finding contentment in the Lord Jesus Christ. So hear now the word of the Lord. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I am looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send greetings. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. When I was a a young man, there was, I remember a a moment, I think I was about 10 years old or so, and I was uh, playing a game on the computer, and all of a sudden a pop-up came notifying me that I had won a free cruise. Uh, And I remember my mother was sleeping at the time, but I ran to wake her to notify her that we had won a free cruise. Uh, And you're smiling because you know what she said to me. Joe, go leave me alone. It's it's a scam, right? We've all encountered these things. But I want you to consider for a moment, what if it actually happened? What if you received that email or that that pop-up showed up on your screen? And for once, it wasn't a scam. For the for you've won an amazing. Uh, sweepstakes, and you're about to head off on a trip, a two-week trip, all inclusive to the dream destination of your choice. You're going to stay in the finest hotels, five-star only. You'll eat the highest quality food prepared by the most seasoned cooks in the world. You'll see some of the most beautiful landscapes, drive most of the luxury vehicles. Whatever you desire, this trip will meet it. But there's some fine print here. And you always have to pay attention to the fine print. And the fine print of this trip, in order to go on it, there's going to be one thing that you can't bring with you, one thing that you cannot have on this trip, and that is contentment. For two weeks, you're going to experience only discontentment at every point during the trip. Now, would you do it? Two weeks of dissatisfaction in the most extravagant places possible? And it seems like for us the answer would be clear, no. Why would I spend my two weeks being a a discontent, even if it were to be in this amazing setting? But the reality is that many of us, and many of the most elite members of our society, uh, are essentially living out this kind of tragedy of a life. Many people possess... uh, the very things we mentioned, and yet they are woefully discontent. They are exhausted, they are empty, they are bored, and they are self-medicating. But now I want to offer you another option, another trip that you can choose. And this is going to include a painful trial of suffering, 
You'll be publicly beaten. You'll be imprisoned uh, in a dungy prison, prison. You'll be deprived of food, water, and standard medical care. You're going to be surrounded by other suffering prisoners and all of the smells that come along with them. But you will be filled with such a supernatural contentment through the presence of God that you'll be able to rejoice greatly. Now, which would you choose? A life filled with stuff and a soul that is empty? Or a life that, although from the outside perspective may appear bleak, yet is marked by an inner contentment that anchors you? See, these two options, although they're a bit of a caricature, a bit of a heightened example, they really are the two uh, ways that we can move through this life. And they touch upon the question of what does it mean to be content? A question that the Apostle Paul uh, pushes to the forefront of our minds as he comes to the close of his letter. And he wants us to stop and to consider and to ask ourselves, what does it mean to be content? And what does a life of contentment produce? What does it look like? What does it mean to possess, as one uh, Puritan writer called it, the rare jewel? Of Christian contentment. But before considering these things, contentment and its effects, you have to look at the needs that are facing Paul and the Philippians, and by implication, us as well. The needs that so often threaten our discontentment. And so those will be our three kind of points for this morning. The threat of discontentment, the nature of contentment, and finally, the mark of contentment. So let's take a look. We start with the threat of discontentment. I already alluded to it in that kind of second uh, offer that I made to you. It really was, the, the, what I was describing was the life of the Apostle Paul. Uh, so much of his experience uh, post-conversion was that. In fact, he's writing this letter from prison. And his external circumstances are, are not great. And his future prospects are looking quite bleak. He speaks of facing plenty and hunger. Both, he says abundance and need, which I, I always chuckle at because if you read Acts or you read Paul's letters, when is he ever in a place of abundance? It seems like he's always in a place of need. It seems like he's always afflicted and facing difficulty in his life. He was a man who suffered much for the message that he proclaimed. And the Philippians, to whom he's writing, they have needs as well. And Paul doesn't point explicitly to them in the passage that we've read, but you can see it in verse 19 when he says, And my God will meet all your needs. The reason Paul has to say that is because they have needs which are currently not being met. They are presently facing needs. And what's mentioned here implicitly, uh, Paul lays out elsewhere explicitly. In 2 Corinthians 8, he talks about, uh, he's encouraging the church at Corinth to give. And he mentions these these believers in Philippi, and he says that they were in extreme poverty. So this is the situation. Paul himself, imprisoned, hungry, facing death and threats of death, and the Philippians, believers who are beleaguered, poor, uh, without material circumstances or um, support. And there's these needs. And all of you have come into this room this morning with different needs and concerns. You've only met me for the first time. You don't really know me. I don't really know you. But I do know that you have needs because I know that you are a human living in a fallen world. And so you might come into this room this morning with needs related to your health. Perhaps you are uh, laboring under a uh, diagnosis that is just really challenging struggling to work through it. Perhaps you have come into this room and you find yourself unemployed or underemployed and you're wondering, how am I going to meet my rent? How am I going to pay my mortgage? How am I going to provide for my family? Perhaps you have some of the more intangible needs, the needs of uh, community. You come into this room and you feel isolated, disconnected, unknown, and unloved. And you're struggling with that. Perhaps you find yourself separated from loved ones, those who have gone on to glory or those who live in other parts of 
of the world and you're dealing with the isolation and the loneliness that comes with that. All of us come into this room with needs. And what Paul points up for us here is that whenever we experience needs, whenever we have concerns, whenever we have wants, discontentment is often closely trailing behind. It is often the case that in the presence of want, you can find a threat of discontentment. And you might say, well, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say that I'm discontent. I'm just a bit worried, a bit jittery, a bit, a bit anxious. But if you were to get under the hood, if you were to, to look a little bit deeper at these different emotions and experiences that we have in the face of need, often you might be surprised to find discontentment at their root. You might be surprised to find that lingering very closely is discontentment. And so whether you are grumbling about your present circumstances, or you're filled with bitterness over the past, or you just have this anxiety about the future, these very well may be signs that discontentment has begun to take root in your heart. And I think this is so much harder when you consider the consumeristic culture in which we live. Because every billboard, every commercial, every ad is communicating one message. You don't have enough. And you deserve more. And how much worse is this in the day of where you have targeted advertisements, right? It's, it's amazing how you can be having a conversation. I'll be speaking with my wife about, I think at one point we were talking about getting a new mattress. And then you go on the internet or you go on social media and all of a sudden there's all these advertisements for mattresses. You're wondering, this is very disturbing, but it's also very convenient because I do need a mattress, right? But there's this, these, it's so difficult when so much of the culture is so tailored to fill your needs. Every craving, every want you have, there's somebody who's ready to meet it. And that can fuel discontentment. It can fuel this unsettledness that I need more. My wife and I, uh, in August of 2022, we recently became homeowners, and I've noticed over the course of this, these past six months how quick my list of things I want to do on the house has grown. And there's always something, oh, I, I, we could do this, and this could be a little bit better, and there's always something to be done, another need to be met, another desire to be fulfilled. There's always this threat of discontentment. And so how... Uh, how do we find contentment in a world like that? In a world where everything is pushing us towards dissatisfaction, towards saying, I need more. Well, Paul teaches us in, in verses 11 through 13, and he offers us at least three things that we need to notice if we're going to understand and, and experience the kind of contentment that Paul uh, has here. The first thing we need to see is that contentment is not based on our circumstances. Look with me at verse 11. Paul says, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. You know, there are some people who think, perhaps you subscribe to this idea, that if I can just find the right circumstances, then I will be content. If all of my basic needs are being met, if my general desires are, are satisfied, then I can know contentment. But in fact, this is an illusion. There's this poem, a, a funny poem, it's called Present Tense, and it captures this illusion well. Hear how the poem goes. It was spring, but it was summer I wanted. The warm days and the great outdoors. It was summer, but it was fall I wanted the colorful leaves, and the cool, dry air. It was fall, but it was winter I wanted, the beautiful snow and the joy of the holiday season. It was winter, but it was spring I wanted, the warmth and the blossoming of nature. I was a child, but it was adulthood I wanted, the freedom and the respect. I was 20, but it was 30 I wanted, to be mature and sophisticated. I was middle-aged, but it was 20 I wanted, the youth and the free spirit. I was retired, but it was middle-aged I wanted, the presence of mind without limitations. My life was over, 
but I never got what I wanted. You can chase through life trying to get what you want, but you will not get what you want. And you will come to your end of your life having only dealt with a, a, a period after period of discontentment. And so what do you think needs to change in your life in order for you to be content? Think about it. What do you think in your life needs to change for you to be content? Do you need enough money to not have to worry about your budget? Do you need to progress to, in, to progress in a certain level in your career? Do you think if, if only the right people were in office, then I could be content? What is it that you think you need because however you answer that question whatever you think you need it will not deliver the things of this world will not deliver the contentment that you and I so greatly crave and so the first thing we need to do is to recognize that is to consider that my circumstances are not going to deliver the contentment that I so greatly want we're going to need something that supersedes our circumstances. We're going to need something that's going to anchor us regardless of the storms of life, the ups and the downs. And what we need in truth is really not something, but what we need is a person. What we need to see is that our uh, contentment is not found in our circumstances, it's found in a person. And this is the second thing that we need to learn about contentment, that contentment is most fundamentally a person. Paul says that I have learned the secret to being content. Thankfully, it's a secret that he makes public. And he tells us in verse 13, I can do everything through him, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, who gives me strength. The source of contentment is the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, it is through your faith union with Jesus, that you can experience the strength that you need to find contentment regardless of your circumstances. It is Jesus himself who not only teaches us about what it means to be content, but he gives us himself. And he says, I will supply for your every need according to my glorious riches. Everything that you need to glorify me and do my will, I will supply it. I will supply it. Now this verse, Philippians 4.13, is a favorite of many, quoted often, but unfortunately it's probably one of also the most misquoted verses as well. You can see it with athletes on their eye black or... Um, writing it on their shoes. There's one mixed martial artist who has it tattooed on his chest, and then in 2017, he was busted for steroid use and, and was <laughs> kicked out. And it's just the, how often it's used and misused in these contexts, right? But Paul's point is not that you can do anything that you want. It's not that you can shoot the basket or, or hit the home run or, or score the touchdown. Paul's point is that despite his circumstances, despite he is imprisoned, despite being hungry and poorly clothed, that he is content because Christ is enough. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. He is my portion. He is the one who supplies my needs. And so here really is the secret sauce of contentment. It is to look not to your circumstances, but to look to the Christ who is over all of your circumstances. It is to look to the Lord Jesus Christ and to see that my contentment comes not from my, the place that I am at, from the, but from the person who is with me in every place that I go. Christ is enough. And it is a contentment that comes both from him and it comes with him. It comes from him, right? Jesus, uh, when he ascended, he sent forth his spirit. And if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit that God dwells in you and with you and he reminds you and encourages you that nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ. And it is the Holy Spirit who is not only making you uh, more like Jesus, but who is 
comforting you with the love and the care of Jesus, who is teaching you that he is with you. And, and it's a contentment that comes with Christ, who will never leave us or forsake us. Paul said earlier in Philippians 3, he says, What is more, I consider everything lost compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. Paul said, you can take it all, but if I have Jesus, that is enough. He is with me in the highs and the lows of life. And until you grasp that, until I grasp that, I'm always going to be trying to find contentment elsewhere. In my 20s, in my 30s, in fall, in spring, whatever it might be. But Paul says, no, contentment alone can come through Christ. And so contentment is not found in our circumstances, it's found in a person. But I love Paul's realism. Because if you and I are honest, uh, you know that contentment is found in Jesus Christ, but that still is a very difficult thing uh, to actualize, to, to see really working boots on the ground, as it were. But Paul thus reminds us in the third point that contentment is something that must be learned. Contentment is Learned. Notice in verses 11 and 12, twice Paul says, I have learned contentment. Right? Paul didn't say, I you know, prayed some prayer or the, an angel gave me some special food from heaven and, and immediately I was content. No, he says that it's something that I had to learn. And there are two schools that Paul went through in order to learn contentment. He went through the school of prosperity, and he went through the school of poverty. Right? This is not what Paul says. He says, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. And as you and I pass through these two schools, uh, we need to learn what it means to say that Christ is enough. These are the exams, as it were, that the Lord puts us through. He puts us into the school of prosperity. He puts us into the school of poverty. And he says, I need you to learn something. And what I need you to learn is that Christ is enough. Consider with me for a moment just the school of prosperity. I think many of us would like to be enrolled in this school if we had to choose. But the striking thing about the school of prosperity is that it's probably the harder of the two. I think of the children of Israel, who uh, the Lord says to them, when you enter into the land and, and there's an abundance of food and, and all of this, don't forget me. And they forget him. Because it is often in our prosperity when we are more exposed to greed, more exposed to discontentment, more likely to worship the gods of comfort rather than the God of all comfort. Think of what the preacher said in Ecclesiastes 5.10, the one who loves money is never satisfied with money. And so there are dangers, pitfalls to be faced in the school of plenty. Now you might say, well, don't worry, Joe, I'm broke. <laughs> I assure you, the school of plenty is not one that I am in. And you might feel poor in relation to others, but the truth is that for all of us, we do possess a great degree of wealth by virtue of where God has allowed us to be born and to live. We possess a great deal of comforts, creaturely comforts that many in the world know not even of. And so all of us, to one degree or another, are facing this school of plenty. And so what does it mean to learn contentment in the school of plenty? Well, John Calvin put it well when he wrote this. He said, quote, He or she who knows how to use present abundance soberly, moderately, and with thanksgiving prepared to part with everything whenever it may please the Lord, giving also a portion to his brother or sister according to his ability, and is also not prideful, that man or woman has learned to excel and to abound. In other words, if you want to excel and abound in the school of plenty, you must learn to receive everything with thanksgiving. You must be ready to part with it and to give to others who are in need and you must not be prideful over the amount of prosperity that you have gained. These are indicators of passing the tests as it were. But what about the school of 
poverty, right? This is surely the school that Paul is enrolled in as he's writing to these believers in Philippi, one that he was familiar with. If you were to read the letter of Corinthians, right, there's that one portion where he just details all of the hardships he faced, hunger and thirst, being poorly clothed, roughly treated, homelessness, sleepless nights, imprisonment. And it's easy to think that if I'm in the school of poverty, well, uh, you know, then I, I kind of can feel a little more safe. Perhaps I won't be as greedy. I won't be as discontent because I'm just going to be throwing myself upon the Lord in need. But even there, even when we are impoverished, greed can still flourish. Discontentment can still be breeded. Because if the challenge in the school of plenty is to want more, the challenge for those in the school of poverty is to often want more as well, more than you already have. And, it, and this goes beyond the world of money. You can experience poverty in many areas of your life. Perhaps you experience a, a, a poverty of, of beauty or of, of popularity or, or discontentment and greed can take root even there where there's envy covetousness, a desire uh, to be like someone else, to be in their home, in their job, in their family, married to their spouse. And so in both schools, whether that of plenty or poverty, there is something to be learned. And what needs to be learned is this. Not self-sufficiency, but Christ-sufficiency. That is what Paul is calling us to learn. That whichever school you find yourself enrolled in this morning, You must look to Christ. And it's not enough to know that that Christ is sufficient in theory. It's something that you must know experientially, something that must be worked into the fibers of your heart to know that in him you have everything you need and apart from him you have nothing. So our prayer should be this morning to ask, Spirit of the living God, teach me that Christ is enough. Teach me that Christ is enough. And as the Spirit begins to do this, as he begins to teach you and to work contentment in your life, what you'll see is that contentment is not a static thing. That contentment is dynamic. That contentment actually does something to us. It produces things in us. It changes the way that we move and be in the world. And the way that that looks most primarily is through generosity. That is what Paul shows us finally, that one of the primary marks of a spirit that is content is generosity. Notice that Paul's final thanksgiving. He says in verse 14, Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. See, Paul doesn't want the Philippians to think, Hey guys, all of this talk about contentment means I don't really need your gift. You know, you could have kept it. Thanks anyways. I don't really really care. He doesn't want to communicate a, that he didn't need their help. To be content does not mean that we lack needs. Contentment doesn't eliminate our needs. It simply relativizes our needs. It helps us see the things that we need most fundamentally. And so we can be rejoice when people help us. We can be glad. We can receive with joy the aids of others because we know that Christ is at work through them. That Christ is meeting our needs and ultimately he will never leave us or forsake us. But with that said, we see that these Philippians, they bear this mark of generosity. Because when you and I are are content in Christ, when we are satisfied in Christ, we are then free to be generous to others. Notice this reciprocal relationship between Paul and the Philippians. Paul says, thank you for partnering with me in suffering, and in joining me, he says, in both giving and receiving. Paul was giving to the Philippians. He had planted this church. He was writing this letter of pastoral encouragement. He was praying for the Philippians. He was giving of his life for them. And the Philippians are also caring for him. They're supplying his needs. They, as it says, as Paul says, that he's received this gift from Epaphroditus. But Paul is super clear that while he appreciates these gifts, what really gets him excited is their generosity. He says in verse 
uh, 17, not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what, me, what may be credited to your account. Right? Even as he receives from the Philippians, he sees beyond the gift and he says, I see what's going on here. You all are satisfied in Christ and you are giving. And for that reason, I rejoice. He is more pleased by the, the demonstration of their generosity, which is a mark, which is a fruit of their contentment in Christ. He says what may be credited to your account. Now, you might think, well, does generosity earn me credit with God? Am I sort of kind of building out my credit with God, trying to earn his favor through generosity? Of course not. That's why Paul goes on to say that they're a fragrant offering, right? In verse 18, they are an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. Family, you all have been made priests to your God. The priesthood of all believers. And one of the ways you fulfill that office is through the giving of generous gifts to those who are in need. That is, those who have been clothed in the righteousness of Christ and who have received all things, who have uh, an inheritance that is coming, a new heavens and a new earth, you can now give freely as a sacrifice of praise to the Lord. And you're giving not to appease God, to make him more happy with you, but you're giving because you've been given everything. And so our generosity is a response to the generosity of God. And so we need to search our hearts and ask, how, how am I doing in this area? Is my life flavored by generosity? Am I a cheerful giver? As Paul will say elsewhere. I have to say that this is such a, a, a challenge to me. So often I, I can operate out of a mentality of mine. I earned it and therefore it's mine. And uh, maybe I'll help if I can, but don't forget whose this belongs to. Or if it's not that, then you can, I can often operate out of this, this mentality of, of want, right? Well, if I, if I give, who's going to supply my needs? If I'm always pouring out, then won't that just leave me empty? And what this shows is a lack of contentment. I see it even in my own heart. And so what is the way forward? Well, the way forward is to lay hold of the promise of verse 19. And my God will meet your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Friends, whatever need you face, God will supply. Now you may be thinking, but I have plenty of needs in my life presently, which as far as I can tell, are not being met. How, how is this promise true for me? Well, the first thing to think about is Paul's own life. The man is in prison. <laughs> Surely all of his needs are not being met. And yet he can say this in confidence. He can say this in truth. But how? I think the reason is because Paul understands what we so often miss, that the things that we often perceive as needs are really only wants. And Paul says, my God will supply your every need. Not everything that you might want, not every whim that you might have, but but there's an even bigger point because what is the greatest need of every human being? Is it not to be set in right relationship with God? Is it not to be reconciled to our creator? To be brought into his fellowship, to be forgiven? And yet so many reject this notion. They think that my felt needs are the needs of the day. But underneath all of that, is a true and abiding need, an eternal need, a need to be reconciled unto God. And it is this need which Christ has met. That through his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, he has made it possible for us to enter into the Father's house. And Paul understands this. And so even though he's sitting in this, this dungy prison, rotting away, he's content because he knows though they may kill the body, they cannot kill my soul. Everything is working out for a far weight of glory. The glory of sharing in the resurrection of Christ. That, my friends, is the kind of contentment that transcends all circumstances and is rooted in a person, the person of Jesus Christ. Do I have it? 
Do you have it? Only God knows, but the path to obtaining it is to lay hold of Christ and to lay hold of every promise in his word and let it work into your hearts. Let it capture your imagination until it is more real to you than your circumstances. So I leave you this morning with these two truths. Remember that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you and that God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Jesus Christ. If you lay hold of these promises, you can weather any circumstance or storm. Are you in need? God will supply. Do you feel prone to discontent with God's supply? He will strengthen you. Together you can know that Christ is enough. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you that you are that, our Father. That you are a good, righteous, and true Father. That you know precisely what we need better than even we do. Lord, we thank you for your Son, our elder brother, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has supplied for us our greatest need, which is to be raised from death unto life, to be brought into your home and to be made your children, we praise you. Let us rejoice evermore in our salvation this day. We ask that you would fix our eyes on Christ so that come what may, whether if we face plenty or we face poverty, we can say it is enough because Christ is enough. Oh Lord God, please give us this kind of contentment as only you can give. We ask that you would grant it By grace, through your Holy Spirit, we ask in your Son's name. Amen. At this time, we have the opportunity to respond to God.